Hello everyone, I'm Andy Davo and welcome to another guide video. Today's offering, Lizardmen. In this video I'm going to cover off a load of different topics for you. Uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce the players that make up the team and how they work. Then I'm going to go and look at the starting rosters and also how to level the team, individual players, the different career paths. Some players level up uh, in multiple different ways. Then we'll go and move over to strategy on pitch. So I'm going to explain to you a little bit about offensive and defensive strategy and setups for both defensive and offensive use. Uh, sorry, round out the guide with inducements and what inducements you should be taking and which ones you should steer clear of. Just a quick summary of Lizardmen. Uh, their strengths, first of all, they're very, very fast. They've got a Croxagorth movement six, all the strength four players are movement six, and then their little fast players are movement seven or movement eight. Half the team is armor AV10+, plus. got dodge and stunty on some of the players so they can really move around. They don't need very many skills to get to the absolute best, although adding additional skills does make them even stronger. They've got one of the best big guys in the game. So there's a lot going on for them in the strengths column. However, they do come with some weaknesses. I said half the team is really strong and high armoured. The other half is really weak and really fragile. It's got stunty, uh, although it is quick. Uh, they don't start with any starting skills of note other than dodge on the skinks. They're expensive and they can't pass the ball. So they're very, very good at running, but they cannot pass. Now, let's go and look at the team and see what it's all about. Right, let's introduce the players and talk about how we would level them up. So Lizardman have changed slightly since Blood Bowl 2 and we only had three different types of positional. Uh, with Blood Bowl 3, we've now been introduced a fourth positional, uh, which is a chameleon skink, which we'll get to at the end. First of all, we're going to introduce the Croxigore. Uh, this is the obligatory big guy. You'll be taking this in all rosters as soon as you can get hold of him. He's brilliant. Probably, arguably, one of the best big guys in the game. I think the Rat Ogre on Skaven might have something to say about that, but I think he is one of the best big guys in game and certainly an auto pick. Whether he, whether you think he is the best or not, you will always take him once you've got enough money. Uh, we've got the Mighty Blow skill, we've got Thick Skull, and when he's also AV10+, plus, he can take a bit of punishment. Uh, he's movement six, so very, very quick. Uh, and the other core skill on this player uh, is Prehensile Tail. So that means that anyone who needs to dodge away from him is doing so at a minus one penalty. So an elves normally dodge on a two, they're now dodging away on a three. Uh, Orc Blitzers, human linemen that dodge away on a three, now dodging away on a four. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of an adventure trying to escape from this guy. If we then go and look at the skill tree here, we'll notice that primary skills uh, are in strength only, and then we've got secondary skill access in general and agility. So first of all, we can build into the prehensile tail element. And if we jump into the strength tree, we want to take guard because he can be pressed into other players. That gives us a lot of uh, ability to inflict uh, additional support for our other players. Stand firm, another very good skill, which means we don't get pushed away. And ideally, they're probably the two skills in here that you would take uh, straight away. You've already got Mighty Blow, that's great. There's not really a lot of anything else in here that you, you want to take. If we just quickly look at Break Tackle, I think I've covered that in other guide videos. That has changed from the into the new rule set. It's now uh, only adding plus two. Well, he's agility five plus, so now he's agility three plus. So we're dodging away on a three plus. It's better than it was. It's still not great. If you want to take break tackle, you're probably combining that up with dodge. Uh, so you're dodging on a three plus with a reroll. It's okay. It's not as good as it was. Another notable skill pick, you could take grab and you could also take armbar. I think both of those are situational skills and for much further down the development track, and um, probably as a fourth or even a fifth skill once you've run out of taking good skills. Um, but they are, they are there, and they're okay. Armbar synergizes with making people fail dodges. You've got Prehensile Tail for that. And Grab helps you keep players near you so that they don't just get uh, to run away for free. Jump into the general tree. There is only the one skill you'll be looking for here, realistically, and that's Block. If you can take other skills, then Pro and Tackle are probably the other two skills that you might want to take. Pro being a 3+, plus to reroll any individual D6. That means on a 3+, plus we can reroll the Bonehead Fail. That's okay. Not as strong as block though. And tackle synergizes with the prehensile tail. So again, it's all right. It's a, it's a reasonable pick, but it's probably not top tier. So the first few skills I would go for are guard, block, stand firm. The order to suit you, uh, you'll get guard faster. If you want to save for block, that makes a lot of sense. It makes the player a lot more reliable, but guard, block, and then stand firm, probably in, in some order. We go look at the agility tree. There are a couple of interesting skills in here that you might want to look, to look at. Um, I think there are three, and that is number one, dodge. If you want to build a block, dodge, stand firm, guard, prehensile tail, it's pretty unpleasant. Um, so that, that would work. You could also stick defensive on it. A strength five or a strength four player with defensive is an absolute nightmare for your opponent. And so again, it's probably a skill pick four slash five. 
Very strong, though. And then the other one, which I think you can play around with. I don't think it's necessarily super powerful, but you, you could play around with it, which is Diving Tackle. You've already got a minus one uh, with the Prehensile Tail. Why don't we make that up to minus three <laughs> with Diving Tackle as well? So you could go, uh, if you were going crazy, Block, Dodge, Diving Tackle, Tackle, Stand Firm. Like, that's an insane player to just go and put against someone's ball carrier. It's a lot of investment, and it's totally unreliable, but I think you'd have a lot of fun with it. So now that's a Croxy Gore. Uh, ultimately, I'm saying take block and guard, but I'm saying that there are other options out there if you either have a lot of time uh, or a, uh, a lot of star player points to throw out the problem. So next, we're going to go on to the Saurus blockers. They are had a, they've had a cost increase since Blood Bowl 2, and that is going to affect the uh, the roster building, which we'll come on to shortly. Core stats for these, movement 6, strength 4, uh, and AV 10+. plus. So again, very well armoured, but doesn't have any core skills. And there are no starting skills in here, look. That means that... Uh, while they've got great skill access, general strength uh, and agility on secondaries, we'll be looking to take block as our first skill across the board on all six, unless you want to go something a little bit uh, uh, crackers, which is uh, wrestle tackle uh, or wrestle tackle strip ball. I'd advise six block and then lean into tackle afterwards on someone. Once we've got our core of six block, then you're going to be building into one of two different dynamics, really. The, the blockers, the guys that hold the line, they do the fighting, and they're the support pieces. You probably want four of those. Then you're going to need uh, a killer, and you're going to need a support player. Now, the killers, you could have two of them and no supports, or you could have one and one. It's up to you. Um, I like to, to, to really go for four support players. The, the blockers, well, I'm going to be truthful here. I'll probably go for the two killers, right? But they, they are fun. We'll take block across everybody. And then on the support players, we take guard, and I then take stand firm. That gives me block, guard, stand firm, and it lets me go and push those players into somebody uh, and be done with them. If I was saving up for a double on one or two of those, then let's just jump into the agility tree. And it used to be dodge. Now it's defensive. Defensive turns off guard in your opponent's turn. If you've already got strength four and you've already got block, uh, sorry, guard, you're inflicting guard on everybody and then they don't get to inflict guard back. Hitting that player is almost impossible. So you don't need to take defensive on everyone because you only need one person touching any uh, guard, but you probably do want maybe two or maybe, maybe three, so certainly two. I think block guard, stand firm defensive is once you get to the higher team, team values, probably going to be very, very, very uh, obnoxious. Going back to the other type then, so we're talking about the killers. We'll start with block. I also like to, to try and get in a tackle and a frenzy into that player. So block, tackle, frenzy. We're going to be hitting stuff consistently. So mighty blow makes a lot of sense. And then after that, you might want to take consider something like Juggernaut uh, or indeed just guard because having seven guard on the team would make a lot of sense. So that's your the killers. And that's why you can have two of them because you could take uh, Juggernaut on one with frenzy and then the other one could take strip ball. But ultimately make sure you've got two block tackle um, players, ideally with mighty blow. Block tackle mighty blow on two of them and then lean out after that. Uh, at that point, I don't think you want to be taking anything in this tree here. Defensive doesn't really synergize with what they're trying to do. Dodge is for defense. I don't think it really helps you with what you were trying to do. Um, and I don't think you need to stand firm uh, and sidesteps really expensive. One thing I do want to counsel so far on this is that these skills cost 40 team value each because they're secondaries. So yes, you, you're talking about a chosen skill. Be very careful. Don't spam them into your team. Just just sprinkle one or two in, right? They're, they're there just to add a little bit of something extra rather than to be the, the main source of the team. Um, from a characteristics point of view, I don't really think you want to be saving up for a characteristic on the Saurus blockers. Movement six up to seven. Nah, not really. They're already fast enough. Strength four up to strength five is incredibly unlikely to happen. So it's nearly not going to happen. I wouldn't bother. Agility is terrible. Passing is terrible. Armor is not great. I wouldn't, I really wouldn't be bothered with it. So I, I don't think you need to be saving up for stats on this. I think you just need to take block guard and then either build them into support players uh, or combat players, depending on what you want to do. Next, we've got the skink run alignment. So the skink run alignment or normal skinks, as I'd like to term them, are indeed uh, normal skinks. So we've got movement eight, super fast. Unfortunately, really strength two. And they're also AV eight plus and stunty. Well, it's when, whenever this player is not in the, it's not actually on the on the tooltip. But if a player gets a uh, hit uh, who's stunty, they're gonna get casualties on a nine plus and they get KO'd on a seven plus. So they are more likely to leave the field. And they're also uh, only AV eight plus. So yeah, eight, on an eight plus, you're gonna break their armor with strength two. So that's a little triumvirate of problem uh, for you to deal with. They do come with the dodge's defensive skill and they are really fast. 
So there they are, they're quite useful. They've got some interesting uh, skill access, which is agility on primaries only. So if we dive into the primary tree, you'll notice they've already got the single best skill in here. That's dodge. Um, and after that, defensive on a strength two player, unless you've got a lot of guard, is a bad idea because that'll just get punched and killed. So a lot of people will take sidestep, diving tackle uh, as a support player. But I think the, uh, the, the players, there are two types of player that will really get picked out. Number one, uh, is Sneaky Git. You will take Sneaky Git on one of those skinks almost immediately. And then once you've got Sneaky Git, you'll jump into here uh, and you will be taking the Dirty Player skill. Sneaky Git Dirty Player. So it's cost you 12 star player points here uh, and six here. One of those has gone up to a, a few more. So we're talking about 20-ish star player points, maybe 24, to get you a Sneaky Git Dirty Player. Get one of those immediately. They were amazing. You could almost run two. Then we need to make a decision about who's going to be the ball carrier because these guys are naturally a bit faster. Um, and their agility three plus. If we just go and quickly look, uh, slightly out of turn, and go and look at the chameleon skinks, you'll notice the chameleon skinks are only movement seven, but they do have passing agility three plus rather than passing access four plus on the standard skinks. And these guys have got on the ball, which means that at the start of the drive, one of them can move towards the ball uh, for three squares for free. So that starting movement skill uh, of seven, not eight, is negated considerably by the uh, on the ball skill. However, they are still only movement seven, so it's it's an interesting choice. Do you want a slightly slower throwing type player, or do you want a slightly faster non-throwing type player? And that's a choice that you're going to need to make. Either way around, if we go back to the skinks, um, what you will certainly be doing is once you've got your dirty player sneaky git, you'll be saving up for characteristics on a lot of them because movement eight up to movement nine. Yes, please. That's amazing. Agility three up to agility two. Uh, it lets you pick the ball up. It lets you dodge three tackle zones and I'm a count, I, I would counsel that the, you know, at least one of these guys is made into a basic ball carrier. So we're looking for statistics. And then once we've got our stats, we'll go into here and we'll take two skills out of this skill tree, uh, which are sure hands and block. Once we've got a movement nine agility two plus uh, block sure hand skink, then we're golden. That is the ability to score at will whenever we want. You will either do that on a chameleon skink or a normal skink, your choice, but ultimately that's what you'll be doing. Uh, and then we'll try and build the others as dirty player sneaky gits. Uh, and you might, might actually choose to build them in the way they were intended, uh, which is you might take someone with sidestep and diving tackle. But ultimately those skills are a little bit bloaty. They don't do it. They don't add enough for the team value. So just stick with a ball carrier and a and a fowler. That should be, should be good enough while saving for stats. Now we're going to look at the chameleon skink. There are a couple of interesting things you can do with chameleon skinks. So we've already got shadowing. That means we can follow people. A statistic increase here and plus movement, absolutely brilliant. That really helps the shadowing work. And because we've got shadowing and we jump into the agility tree, um, it is possible that you take diving tackle. So if you can make someone want to dodge away from a skink rather than punch it in the face, then why not? Diving tackle, why not? Um, we can also take sidestep. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, we've got a safe pair of hands if you want to go down the ball carrying route. But ultimately, you'd be taking this player for either um, the diving tackle sidestep uh, combo or you'd be building him into a thrower. And this is where I think it gets a little bit interesting, which is that the secondary skill tree in here, if you were randoming these skills, leader is an amazing skill to hit uh, because it would cost you 20 team value and a reroll on lizard men is 70 team value. So that's a net saving of 50. If you can get that, that's great. If not, then you might choose to lean into the passing stat of three plus because accurate suddenly means him uh, throwing the ball on a two plus, which is great. Uh, and there are other couple of other weird ones like Fumblerooski. Uh, while you don't normally look take that on a team like this, if you can't throw the ball, you can always run away with it, put it on the floor, let another skink pick up and run away with it again. So Fumblerooski, while I've not recommended it on any other guide video, it is a skill you might get some use out of, certainly if you randomed it. There are some still some terrible skills, right? Uh, dump off, pretty rubbish. Uh, Cannoneer, terrible. Cloudburster, a woeful. Uh, Hail Mary pass, nope. Uh, safe pass, not really. Uh, so it's a bit of a bit of a random lottery. But if you were playing in a perpetual league or you were playing in a three month matchmaking environment where you had infinite time, pretty much, then maybe you could play around with this and, and have some fun. Who knows? Stati characteristic advice is the same as on the normal skinks. You're looking for movement. You're looking for agility. Um, passing is a weird edge case. If you're building a thrower, then have at it. But otherwise, I'd avoid it. Uh, and I would also avoid armor. So that's the how to level up players. 
Uh, hope that was useful. Let's go and have a look at some rosters. Right, okay, let's look at some rosters. And this one, I'm going to go 3 2 1 rather than 1 2 3 uh, because I think roster 1 is by far the strongest. So, roster 3. Uh, this one is designed around the premise of putting the big guy in. So the Kroxgore, I've said in the intro, is a very strong player. In fact, is one of the strongest big guys in the game. So I've put him in. Unfortunately, he's very expensive. And because of the size, uh, the cost increases on the Saurus, we can only now get four Sauruses in. We've then had to fill out the roster with Skinks. Saving the 20k here doesn't really do a great deal. So I've got six Skinks on the roster. And I've only managed to get two rerolls in. I think there is a change you could put in here. I think you could drop this down to six basic boring skinks and then have two extra dedicated fans because the two extra dedicated fans would generate you another 10k a game um, as long as you don't lose. So that's maybe a, a, a tweak to this roster. Um, overall, I think it's quite weak. Uh, you have no block, you have no ball pickup, and you've only got five strength players, one of which doesn't even do as it's told. So it is an option, probably not the best option, but at least it's an option. All right, we're now going to look at roster number two. Uh, roster two is built around the premise of three rerolls. Because we have no core skills, I've put three rerolls in first and then said, right, well, what else do we get? So in this instance, uh, again, we've only got five big things, uh, five dinosaurs. They do all do as they're told, which is wonderful. And so we are missing a Croxagore and we are missing a Saurus blocker. As such, I've then had to fill out hats to fill out the roster this time with no choice uh, with skink runners. Uh, the vanilla skinks, we've got six of them. You could look at it this way, which is, well, one of them's going to die and you don't really care. <laughs> and you're going to replace it with a Saurus anyway. So that works. And from a uh, cost efficiency point of view, the three rerolls probably let you get a little bit more done and add a little bit more reliability in there. So I think this is probably actually a, a reasonably solid roster. It's certainly a solid roster if you're going to play for a while and want to get off to a semi-reliable start because... Once you've got the 85k, you will buy the Saurus, and then you've got your six Saurus. Then you'll save up for the Apothecary, then you'll save up for the Croxigore. So you're, you're about 250k short. It's a shame we haven't been able to put any dedicated fans in there, but if you want to put some dedicated fans in, you can drop the reroll, and at that point you could actually play off six dedicated fans. So you'd be playing two rerolls, five blockers. I think the three rerolls is just safer. You've got them, they're yours, they don't cost double after, they cost double after team creation. You're gonna want three. So unless you're planning to go min-max and down to two at some point, uh, this is actually a, an Andy Devo certified recommended roster. However, roster number one is actually where it is. I've managed to get all six Saurus in on this one. So that was the idea where I bought six Saurus and said, well, what have we got left over? Uh, I've spent everything. So six Saurus, I've then had to fill it out with five basic vanilla skinks. And I unfortunately have had to compromise here. We've only got the two team rerolls. So as you can see that the... The thread and the, the running theme through all of this is you have to compromise somewhere. What are you giving up? Uh, and in this, we've got the two rerolls. However, what we have got here is an apothecary. So I've got 50k in apothecary here. I think if you're playing a short league of, let's say, five, six, seven games, this is the roster I would take or the three reroll roster, but, but probably this one. If I was playing in a, a lot longer league, uh, let's say like a 20 game or a 30 game league, then this is definitely the roster I would take because it's protecting me. Uh, from losing one of the big sauruses straight out the gate and the apothecary and the big six dinosaurs is what i want it gives me the best chance of landing an mvp on one so i'll do that um, a twist if you want to change this roster around a little bit um, is you can drop the apothecary and you can spend some or all of the money in the dedicated fans department and that would mean that you'd be generating uh, around about 35k minimum even if you lost uh, per game uh, although your fun fact yeah, your dedicated fans would fall as you keep losing so you could recoup the money reasonably quickly here if you wanted to throw it all into dedicated fans. And I think that's an either or, depending on your circumstance. That's the three rosters. This is the def This is the one I'd pick. Uh, and in a short, short, short league, I'd be probably looking at, at the two. Uh, sorry, at the three reroll, uh, and then just buying the other Sor Saurus, uh, as it's the quickest route to getting three rerolls uh, and six dinosaurs. Diving into formations. Uh, on first of all, we're going to start off with the offense, uh, and there really is only one standard offensive formation here. Uh, unless, of course, you're trying to score a two-turn touchdown. So, offense, yeah, standard offensive formation here for, for lizard men uh, is this. And I've actually got to this, this, the slight only variation, I think, that is acceptable here, uh, which is on this side, we've gone uh, a chevron that's slightly wider. And on this side, it's a chevron that's slightly tighter together. Uh, if I mouse over the four skinks, you'll see where they are on the field. Uh, and ultimately, they're all protected. These can be chameleon skinks or they can be normal skinks, but ultimately, they're going to be protected. And then... We've put the big dinosaurs on the front line and you'll see that as I move over here, 
the numbers are highlighting where they are. I'm assuming at this point that the opponent has provided their uh, placed their players in the central line of scrimmage in directly in front of numbers 3, 2 and 4, uh, in front of these three players here. And then we'd be blocking diagonally from our left across to the right so we can get two dice blocks. Um, in terms of how to open with this turn, if the ball goes deep, then against a faster team, you probably want to drop all of the skinks back to go and cover it, and then the closest skink goes and picks it up. Or the skink that is on three star player points, or the one that you're trying to get the the, the stat increase on, or the moving uh, the, uh, the 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 double on. But ultimately, the skinks should swarm towards the ball, and then the dinosaurs stand there and, and form uh, a line. And once you've got, even if the ball goes deep here, you've got eight squares of movement. You should then be able to reconnect your team uh, on turn two. And the goal is to to reconnect. If you can do something extra which would be that i would be looking to allow my opponent to sweep into one of the sides but not the other what you can do there is you can take number six and you can fold it across here and you might take number seven and fold it across here and you end up with a line here yes you're leaving this side open that's fine they're going to run around here and then if your ball is here you just run north and you can reconnect that's fine um, ultimately what you're looking to try and do on the offense that start is have a nice line of the strong players here and then screen all your ball carrier and, and pieces here. It doesn't have to be a cage. It does not need to look exactly like this. Uh, it just needs it with nine holding the ball. You know, it could be nine is here um, and then the players are screening. So you're actually creating an L shape uh, with your players because they shouldn't be able to get through. Of course, if they've got a high agility player or someone that's going to be a bit of a hero, then you can't leave it as open as that. And you probably need to just sort of protect it. Something along that lines. One other offensive problem that I see a lot of lizard coaches do. Uh, and while we're on, on the subject, uh, we need to just look at this. We cannot put our ball carrier directly behind our Sauruses uh, against any elf or skaven team. Because they potentially can dodge into the square here on a 5+. Plus. And then if they've cancelled the, uh, the assists on numbers 5 and 6. If they're strength 3, they get 2 dice on the ball. And you think, well, that's crazy. But a 5 plus is going to work 55% of the time. Yeah, half the time, that 5 plus hero play is going to work. And if they do, it's the last action of the turn, or you know, nearly last action of the turn. Does it matter if it fails? Massive upside if it works. Low, you know, low downside. So just bear that in mind. That the, the simple and easy solution to that uh, is to do something a little bit like this, where you keep number 9 as holding the ball, and you create an elongated X cage, and you peek the ball uh, there. Once you get really advanced at this, what you'll end up doing is that type of cage. So it's an X with the two being here. So that means that any dodge in here is into lots of tackle zones, normally four or even possibly five. And that means that they are unlikely to be able to dodge in. It's now a six plus, six plus with a reroll, 33%. You know, the, the chance drops dramatically. And because you've got a player inside the cage, it's now, even if they're strength three, it's only one dice, not two dice. So that the probability of losing the ball or having the ball knocked out of your hands drastically drops. Um, yes, you're giving up some position and yes, you're having to make your team a bit tighter, but ultimately your ball carrier's movement eight with stunty and dodge, you should be able to get three or four squares inside your opponent's half over the first six turns. So that's standard offense. Um, and ultimately, yeah, I'm just saying, we're just trying to make a nice screen, keep the ball safe, and then on about turn four, turn five, start progressing up the field. Onto defense, uh, I'm assuming here that we do not want to offset the line of scrimmage. Uh, because it, it, we're just going for a balanced defense. On that basis, uh, we're hiding the four skinks because they're substantially easier to remove. So they, you'll see that these are four players at the back, uh, eight and 10 and nine and 11, and then seven, four, six and five uh, are dinosaurs. I've put the Croxagor in the middle uh, and then I put numbers two and three here. They will become, the two and three are representative of your two least good dinosaurs. And then number one is typically the Crocs. Um, although, if you're playing in some matches, you might keep the Crocodile off the line of scrimmage and replace it with three of your weakest dinosaurs because it depends, do you need to deploy that Crocodile into someone or not? If you do, keep it off the line of scrimmage. If you don't, then it's totally fine to go on there. Um, so consider the racial matchup. There is a variant of this where you can put the players here. Uh, that pulls the opponent out of position slightly and that gives you more space on this side to flood through because you actually do, as a, as a defensive formation, really want to maintain the position in one side and then really shove and chase after the ball uh, early on in a defensive drive uh, and the second because you're totally okay with them scoring on turn four, five, six because you can score in two turns back. It's now 1-1 one, one at the half. You're receiving. You can go on and win the game 2-1. You close out most games like that. You don't even have to be lucky. You just have to push them in before turn eight. 
an offset is totally fine. And this is just a standard setup, assuming that you don't need to defend any sidelines or you're not defending any uh, particular, yeah, anything else special. Next, as I dislike the, uh, the rule of five or the boat setup so much, I couldn't bring myself to recommend it in defensive formations. Equally, I couldn't ignore it entirely because annoyingly it is reasonably effective. So I've created a new boat. Uh, this one is definitely mine and I definitely invented it. Uh, so we'll go with this standard center line of scrimmage. And then these players can either go here, as I'm just demonstrating here. And what that's doing is that's helping defend number two because he can't put an assist in or they can't put an assist in that square there. Therefore, it's difficult to knock these players over. But in so doing, we're isolating our skinks out and people can easily run around the side and smash number 10 in the face uh, or come around here and smash number 11 in the face. So uh, you need to decide, do you need to defend numbers two and three? Or do you need to defend your skinks on 10 and 11? And that will inform you in terms of where they go. All this setup is to do uh, is to just try and keep your team together, keep it alive. And then on turn two, turn three, you'll be then looking to deploy that out uh, based on what sort of threat you're encountering. This is not a bad um, setup against uh, an elf team, although it is going to limit your ability to go and push through them if your opponent plays properly. So uh, it's interesting without being super duper effective. Um, I think I prefer the cups so far. Next one we're going to go for is a sort of anti two turn um, and it's not against frenzy, right? This does not work if you have frenzy. Um, if the opponent has a frenzy player, do not do this. Do not do this if they have frenzy. But this is just basically a column defense and there are actually two different ways you can play this. Um, I've put the skinks at the back, as you'll see here. So we've got skinks being defended by lizard men. One of the things I have done is I've not put the croc score on the line of scrimmage. And that gives us a bit of agency to be able to move that croc score around uh, and engage with our opponent, depending on what's going on. That's probably more important if you're playing into an elf team. The column defense, um, it put, forces your elves to dodge into these squares through, through here. And then you know that they've congregated in the middle. At that point, you're gonna be able to then roll, roll these players back and get around in front of them again and then squish into the cage uh, and make both the catch and any potential dodging through pretty tricky. If you want a variant of this, well, there's two separate variants that you could do. Um, my favorite is something a little bit like this, where we take the back line of the defense and we drop it about six or seven squares back. So I've currently gone six. Uh, if we're assuming we're playing into a movement seven team, do something, whoops, do something like this. And then we pick the front of the screen up and we go back again and what that's doing for us is they want to be able to run through this line and we have decided that we're going to set our line up uh, on there. So th they blitz number four, fine, they can build a cage around number four, but they can't put the cage touching any of these players because then we can push it off. So that's one way of doing it. You can also do the same thing where you just take the entire line and you just drop it back a bit further. It does the same impact. They run it, they have to run forward and then they have to blitz either number one or number four. Uh, but you've, annoyingly, you've got a skink uh, as the player that's going to push in. This works really well if you've got guard. If not, then you want something a little bit like this, where you swap the two players around. And yes, you put the skinks here, but you've got a flat line for them to deal with. And that becomes really problematic uh, for your opponent because they can't really push anything away. So yes, you're letting skinks get hit, but you, they're unlikely to blitz those. So this is a really good anti-two turn um, set up playing around with it like this seeing where they need to stand and just literally trying to put your players in the way um, At that point you can either offset the line of scrimmage or not um, Or you can do stuff like this where you just split it up But I have seen on some guide videos recommending that the dinosaurs are deliberately always split um, Just as a, a point of caution do avoid doing that because if you split them like this all the time They can easily get knocked over by strength three players So for example if we want to knock over this line of scrimmage We'd start with number seven. We'd put a player here, a player here, a player start there. We have players all the way along. That's seven players, but we block on the diagonal. That pushes number seven away. Now the guy that threw the block becomes an assist for number three. So we've got two assists and we've got someone here. They punch number three in the face. And then we've got three players and then number two gets punched in the face. So avoid doing that because, of course, if we put these players back together again, now to hit number seven, you've got to waste an activation and put someone in one of these two squares, punch straight forwards, then you're gonna put another player in, waste that activation, punch number two, then you can have a go at number three. You also only get one hit on all those players. So do avoid uh, splitting the line of scrimmage with the dinosaurs wherever possible, uh, unless it doesn't matter and they just can get two dice on you no matter what. Bear that in mind. Now from a defensive play style point of view, I think liz uh, lizard men are actually really strong. Depending on how you've skilled them, if you've gone block and block guard, what you'll want to do is you'll want to have them in pairs or groups of three 
and you'll go and push into a couple of the strength three players. They then, because you've got strength four block guard, they won't be able to move. They'll have to move away and you'll be able to sort of dominate and bully your opponent. What you're looking to try and do is um, corral your opponent. So we'll end up with something that looks a little bit like this. Um, let's just um, forget the numbers for a second, uh, but you end up with a position that looks a little bit like an L shape and your opponent is ending up here because we've pushed seven, three and two into your opponent. Um, we're blitzing um, where the, 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 the white bar is and we're trying to create an L shape. They're going to really struggle to get through because we've got strength four people at the front. They're going to really struggle to get through the center and then ultimately they'll do something uh, where they, they fail a dodge or they mess something up and then you'll be able to, because your players are based, you'll be able to chain push a few things out of the way and then you'll get a two dice strike on the ball using any of the Saurus because they're all strength four and it's a control team. It is not a combat team or a bash team. I see a lot of people build them with Mighty Blow first. That unfortunately, while fun, uh, is not the correct way to play Lizards. So you want to take block then guard. Uh, it's nice to have a frenzy. It's nice to have a tackle and you are playing them like a control team rather than a, uh, an out and out kill team, which is bizarre considering the, the amount of strength that you have on the team. So that for me is, is sort of a little bit of insight into how to play them and how to set them up. I hope you find it useful. Uh, and we'll now go and look at inducements. Right, so let's look at inducements. Before I go into recommending specific inducements to you, I want to explain what I think lizard men are strong at and I also think why they're weak. And I think one of the most important things that, that lizards, or one of the reasons that lizards struggle, is when they don't have all of their strength four slash strength five players on the field, either because they are missed next game or injured dead, or because they get knocked out, uh, KO'd, and don't come back. With that in mind, I think therefore your, your emphasis should be to try and keep the dinosaurs on the field at all times. Uh, if you're playing into an undead team that is going to foul a lot, then a biased referee is a really good inducement that stops them fouling or limits their ab ability to foul and therefore you know, go with that. If you are in playing into a claw team and you're likely to use lose dinosaurs, then actually adding things like a wandering apothecary or uh, a pair of double Budweiser babes so you get your KOs back, that's really strong. I think kegs are generally a, a good inducement choice for lizard men anyway. Hopefully you don't need to take extra reroll because you're already playing with the correct number. Um, very early on in the team development, I think stepping up from two to three is worth it. And I would consider that. Uh, the wizard is of less value now than it used to be in Blood Bowl 2 because the lightning bolt spell is less powerful. However, a fireball well placed when you're looking at a tight cage generally knocking over one or two of you know, any one of two or four or five players is, is really good. So uh, the wizard is probably more of a game uh, choice when you're playing into orcs or playing into Nurgle, something a bit slow and that wants to bunch up. Uh, if you're playing into elves, I think the wizard is, is absolutely the wrong choice uh, and I would avoid. Overall bribes, if you've taken uh, a sneaky get a dirty player, then a bribe is absolutely uh, a, a top draw choice. If you don't have your sneaky get dirty player skink yet, then it's probably not worth it. So that's situational. Halfling Master Chef is a massive waste of money and a massive waste of time, uh, as I would have said in all videos. Uh, again, the Apothecary com uh, combines up with the Bloodweiser keg. And, and then we've got these two here. This is just 20k of filler. If you have 20k spare, by all means. If you don't, then don't worry. Now, uh, star players. Um, I don't think Gromidal adds enough for you. So unless you've got to choose him, I'd avoid him. Um, Carlevon kill is reasonable uh, and I don't have enough money for Morg so I'd be looking at probably either Morg or Mighty Zug to add an extra bit more beef if you're playing you know, a step TV of say 300 or 400. Hopefully in public matter you're never having to play 3 or 400 TV up or down so that these things become a non-problem but if you are swapping out a skink and putting on a star player of either strength 4 or strength 5 is really good. This is why I would really hope that they would get the lizard star players in because uh, Sibley the dinosaur is amazing and would really add an extra dimension. If however you're only a couple of hundred TV down and you're like this team here which is missing uh, one of its Saurus blockers then this is something that you would want to pick straight away. Purchase the primary skill for this mercenary it increase its team value. Yes, always take block. There we go. So we've now managed to get ourselves back to the basic six dinosaurs uh, and I've given it block. It does cost me 165k but I think in, in some circumstances taking this over taking say a wizard uh, is a really good value because you're trading out a skink on the field and you're putting in a strength for AV10 plus player. Yes, it's got loner, but it'll do a job for you. Just don't try and lean into it too much. Uh, and where possible, do give it block. If you can't give it block, 
then what you're trying to do with this player is just go and tie up against something uh, and just leave it traded out uh, against something re reasonable value, like let's say a, 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 an undead white elf. In the game, never mind. Uh, something strength three with block uh, would be a great idea, like a human blitzer. There we go, uh, a human blitzer. That's that's the team. I hope you found the guide really useful. Um, thank you very much indeed for watching. I stream on Twitch, and if you'd like to come and say hello, then uh, jump in. The link is in the comment section below, uh, and maybe I'll see you at some point in season one. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Hello everyone, Future Andy Devo here. We've just been over the video edit and I noticed a couple of things that are missing. So instead of making a brand new video, let's just put a little uh, edit in at the end. Uh, the first one of the two is that when talking about skink leveling up, I don't mention at all uh, one of the standard career paths, which is trying to build a one turning skink. And that skink normally is sprint and sure feet, sidestep, hopefully you saved for a stat and got movement. And then potentially you've also put catch on there as well. That type of play is super important in any form of long-term league so that you can turn draws into wins and you can turn losses into draws. It does take a long time to develop, so it is only really suitable for a team that's going to play maybe 20, 30, even 40 games. But it is, it should be there, uh, and I missed that one out in the first uh, draft of the video. And then moving on to the second thing, I talk about inducements, and I don't mention any of the lizard star players that are coming into the game. There is going to be Anki Panky, <laughs> I hope we've got that name right. And uh, Glottal Stop. Uh, those players are the Strength 4 uh, Sibley replacement. Uh, it doesn't have guard, sadly, so it is quite a drop down in terms of power uh, over the, the previous model, uh, Sibley. But um, it's still worth possibly taking some of the time. If you've got around about 200k and you're not facing into a claw team uh, and you want to try and dominate with strength, that's the time to take it. The other player, Glottal Stop, is the Strength 6 Croxigore buffed big guy uh, he's very expensive at around like 250k um doesn't really have a lot of a, of a place again unless you want to try and strength bully someone uh, or have already got enough money to buy all of the toys um, he's not a great star player he doesn't have block and he has got frenzy so he's a turnover machine i'd kind of avoid him unless you're just looking to put extra strength on the field and then remove away from the skink so there we go. There's, there's a quick future Andy update uh, and I hope to see you on the pitch sometime soon. Thank you.